In today's video, we're going to explore five different works by C.S. Lewis in a way that allows you to deeply reflect on each text presented. At the end of this video, tell me if you like this type of format we're presenting. Are you curious to know which books will be used? Here's how it will go. First, there will be a question for you to answer. Next, a passage from the book, and then a clear explanation of what that passage means. This way, you can reflect on your answer with the explanation. So feel free to pause the video after each question. Think, write, reflect. First question, as a Christian, have you truly treated each person as your equal? As another living being who also has flaws and can find salvation just as you have? Book, Mere Christianity. The Christian position is that every man should be treated as if he were Christ. That is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. That is what it means when it is said, love thy neighbor will have fulfilled the law. But of course, that's not how we treat others in our daily life. Imagine yourself as a real estate owner a Christian landlord, a landlord whose conduct is regulated by Christianity, would not say, I must treat my tenants as I would like them to treat me. I must remember that my tenants are men like me. Christianity tells him, I am Christ. If you have been given a home and a business, it was as my agent and representative to those men. You should act in a way that I would act in your place. Imagine that each person we meet should be treated not just with respect, but with the love and consideration we would give to Christ. This is the essence of what it truly means to love your neighbor, a fundamental idea for Christians. The divine law teaches us that this sincere love for our neighbor fulfills all the commandments. However, in daily practice, we often fail to live up to this ideal. Let's take the example of a landlord, a real estate owner. If he is guided by Christian principles, his conduct towards his tenants should reflect more than mere justice or benevolence. He must see his position not just as a business opportunity, but as a mission given by God. Instead of treating his tenants merely as a source of income, he should treat them as if he were serving Christ himself. This means offering more than a fair contract. It involves compassion, understanding, and a genuine desire to improve their lives. Conclusion, being a Christian in any part of life each interaction, each decision should be seen as an opportunity to represent Christ on earth. Jesus came not only to save us, but to serve as an example to be followed. And from this, we draw our faith in God. For if we start to act more like Him, we will have our place reserved by His side. Second question. With everything you've learned so far in your life, are you afraid of what the future holds? Book, Letters to Malcolm. Chiefly on prayer. Imagine yourself a living book, a manuscript still being worked on. Consider how difficult it would be to read a page of your own life book and fully understand what is written on it. Even more challenging would be to read it before the other pages are written. Reading such a manuscript wouldn't be like reading a book that's already finished. Things wouldn't come in a logical, neatly arranged order, but would be chaotic, sometimes contradictory. Yet this chaos is what we call real life. From this passage, we can understand life as a book in constant writing, where each page contains experiences, thoughts, and emotions that have not yet reached their conclusion. Each lived moment is recorded, without the benefit of revision or the perspective that time or additional context might offer. It's a view that highlights both the beauty and the complexity of living without a definitive script. The idea of reading a page of our life without knowing the following ones evokes the reality that each decision, each event, is not final or complete in itself, but part of a larger process, often incomprehensible at the moment it occurs. This is because life, unlike a well-structured book, does not present its lines in a logical and predictable sequence. Events and choices overlap, contradict each other, and often only gain meaning when viewed in conjunction with the past and a future still to be discovered. This view can be unsettling, but it is also liberating. Understanding life as an open text allows us to accept uncertainty and chaos as natural parts of the human experience. The lack of logical order and the presence of contradictions are not flaws to be corrected, but aspects of any personal narrative that is still being formed. Thus, we face each day not only as authors, but also as eager readers, discovering and interpreting our own story as it unfolds. Conclusion 
We should not fear the future if we have a past to learn from and the present to shape. Moreover, the future does not depend solely on us, as it is uncertain, and we never know what is coming. Our only certainty is that God will be with us to guide us in good times and bad. If you are enjoying this content, it was God who brought you to this channel. Subscribe and like this video. Third question. You might wonder why you have experienced or are experiencing so much suffering in your life. Maybe the universe is against you. Maybe it's karma. Maybe it's a divine work. Reflect on this before continuing. Book, The Problem of Pain. Suffering can be a burden or it can be a redeemer. It all depends on how the individual perceives their pain. If they see it as an injustice imposed on them by the world and they revolt, their pain can destroy them. But if they see their condition as part of a divine plan, pain can be the means by which they achieve perfection. The idea that suffering can have different meanings in a person's life depends on the perspective with which they view it. When a person understands suffering as an injustice or a punishment imposed by the world, this view can erode their spirit and deepen their pain. In this state, we isolate ourselves, search for where the mistake is, and start to question whether we are worthy of continuing to live, bringing with it deep depression. This is a path in which suffering not only remains as a burden, but also has the potential to destroy the person, both emotionally and spiritually. However, if you interpret suffering as a lesson to be learned, as part of something greater, it transforms into personal and spiritual growth. This perspective does not diminish the pain, but it gives you a purpose. If you believe that each challenge is an opportunity to develop, to learn, or to achieve greater perfection of character, then suffering becomes a powerful means of personal redemption. In this way, pain can be seen as a form of purification or even a disguised blessing, which despite being difficult, carries the possibility of a deeper meaning. When you think about it, it's all a matter of perspective on suffering. Our ability to assign meanings to our sufferings can change our life experience. Deep questions arise about the power of mindset, faith, and human resilience. Then we begin to think not only about how we face all life's difficulties, but also about how we can help others find meaning in their struggles, transforming suffering from an overwhelming burden into a path to redemption. Conclusion. You need not only to improve your way of seeing the lessons that life teaches you, but also can help others find a way to rid themselves of the pain they carry, including your own. Remember how Jesus came to serve as an example in question two? Thus. Fourth question. Do you know how to pray? This question might seem simple. Many think it's just about kneeling down and talking to God. But your lack of genuine feelings can turn it into just another habit. Think about this. After that, continue with the video. You will be surprised by what's coming next. Book, The Screw Tape. Letters. Prayer is one of the moments when man comes closest to the true nature of reality. It is an absolutely natural thing. After all, a creature aware of its own fragility and the eternity that awaits it is naturally inclined to seek connection with the source of all truth in life. Remember, Wormwood, our aim is not to prevent prayer, but to make it an empty activity devoid of any real connection with the eternal. Prayer arises from the human consciousness seeking a connection with something greater than itself. This attitude is rooted in the very nature of human existence. Perhaps you are praying for the wrong reasons. Understand that prayer can lose its true purpose if performed merely as another empty habit or as a simple routine act. When praying, a person must have a genuine feeling for it to be meaningful. Thus, the practice, which should be a sacred means of communicating with God, can be distorted to become merely superficial. After this, we question ourselves. Are we really praying for the right reasons? Are our prayers a real search for comfort or guidance? Or have they become habitual acts with no true purpose? After this, you'll start to recall the moments you kneel down and wonder if all were true conversations with God. Don't regret this. Just change the depth of your conversations. Praying every day does not mean having a greater spiritual connection with God. Conclusion. We can understand that prayer is something to be done when the heart and soul are overflowing with genuine feelings. So when you kneel down and pour out to God, you can have a deep connection with our Lord. 
Well, if you had an answer similar to this conclusion, tell us in the comments because we're about to ask the last question and perhaps the most important one. Fifth question. What do you understand when we mention the word faith? Is it just believing in God? Still think there won't be depth in this last question? You'll see. Book, Mere Christianity. Christian faith is a difficult and complicated thing because it involves both the spirit and reason. Belief in God and the divine does not come easily to those who are willing to really ponder their faith. At the same time, it is a simple thing. It is not mere acceptance, but rather a complete and total submission to the living God. True faith requires that we submit and accept divine precepts, not just because they are the way to eternal life, but because they are good. The Christian faith shows us an interesting duality. It is complex yet simultaneously simple. This originates from a need to develop both spiritually and rationally. Faith is not something that one accepts without question. On the contrary, it invites you to engage in deeper reflections. A true understanding of the divine requires a continual search, which can be a great challenge for those looking to deepen their spirituality. The essence of its simplicity lies in complete submission to the living God. We don't see this as merely accepting a set of rules to follow, but in surrendering body and soul. We can affirm that the essence of all this is based on the recognition of divine precepts, which, as we know, are good and just. And when we decide to follow them, we can not only find salvation, but be guided towards a true and purposeful life. This duality may seem paradoxical, but it is precisely here that we find the beauty and strength of Christian faith. We are challenged not just to accept, but to understand. Not just to think, but also to feel. Not just to question, but to surrender. This balance between intellect and spirit is what can make the journey of faith so profoundly transformative. When we think about the origin of our faith, if we dig deep, we can understand how we act when it comes to having faith. Do we lean more towards reason or emotion? Are we open to questioning ourselves deeply? Or are we satisfied with a superficial understanding? And most importantly, are we willing to completely surrender to what we consider divine? These questions help us understand how we handle our faith and whether we are in complete balance so that there are no doubts in our hearts. Conclusion. Our faith is composed of reason and emotion. You rationally understand that God is a being worthy of our devotion, whose path, though full of challenges, is just and kind with the best intentions for our lives. And emotionally, it is He whom we seek to place our purest and truest feelings and to whom we surrender body and soul. Did you like our video? I sincerely thought it was incredible how much we can learn from C.S. Lewis and his books. After all this, you must feel like a wiser person, just like me. Thank you for watching this far. See you next time.